Good morning. Thank you for joining us for Winship Grand Rounds this morning. If you, are an, if you are an Emory University or healthcare employee and would like to receive CME credit hour for attending today, the login information can be found in the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. If you have any issues with this webinar or the CME login, please send Kadia to Fofana an email or drop a note via the chat, via the chat feature. This morning, we are very pleased to welcome Dr. Sonal Oza. Dr. Sonal Oza completed her residency in physical medicine and rehabilitation at Northwestern University McGaugh Medical Center, the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago in Chicago, Illinois, and her fellowship in cancer rehabilitation at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City. She is an assistant professor in the Department of Rehabilitation Medicine at Emory University School of Medicine. Dr. Oza is a board certified physician in physical medicine and rehabilitation with fellowship training in cancer rehabilitation medicine. Her goal is to maximize and restore physical function for individuals with cancer. Dr. Oza develops personalized comprehensive rehabilitation plans to treat musculoskeletal and neurological conditions resulting from cancer and its treatment. Examples include muscle spasms, joint pains, neuropathy, radiation fibrosis syndrome, fatigue, pelvic pain, bowel or bladder changes, and difficulty with balance and mobility. Dr. Oza has research interests in patient reported outcomes, care delivery, and exercise engagement. She has ongoing projects related to measuring physical function in clinical practice, identifying rehabilitation needs before and after breast cancer surgeries, and describing physical exercise participation among racially diverse breast cancer survivors. Prior to joining Emory, Dr. Oza was an attending physician at the Huntsman Cancer Institute at the University of Utah Health, at University of Utah Health in Salt Lake City, Utah. Dr. Oza holds professional memberships with the American Society of Clinical Oncology and the American Academy of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. So welcome, Dr. Oza. Thank you, Dr. Kano, for the introduction. Good morning, everyone, and, and thanks for joining the talk. Uh, my name is Sonal, and I thought I'd uh, begin by sharing a little bit about um, myself and my interest in the intersection of oncology, rehabilitation, and exercise. So this began during medical school um, with exposure um, to oncology rotations and spending time with patients on the transplant unit, and then also spending some time in the OR with our head and neck cancer surgeons. And then this continued on during residency, um, where I had the opportunity to care for patients with both complex complex oncologic and rehabilitation needs, and then also is introduced um, to the role of cancer rehabilitation research and care, and engaged in projects relating to assessing patient reported outcomes in the colorectal cancer population, and also predictors of exercise participation in lung and breast cancer survivors. And then during fellowship, in addition to expanding clinical training, um, engaged in research relating to capturing rehabilitation measures and outcomes in the head and neck population, and then also assessing exercise initiation after cancer diagnosis um, in a group of socioeconomically and racially diverse survivors. And so collectively building upon this um, experience, I was able uh, to bring this knowledge base to the University of Utah, um, where I led the development development of our um, multidisciplinary cancer rehabilitation program, um, which is comprised of pulmonary physicians, therapy teams, and, and exercise specialists, where we worked um, collaboratively in not only delivering clinical care, but also um, partnering with the researcher in exercise physiology to assess um, our programmatic outcomes, which would then hopefully inform future um, uh, interventional trials. And so now I'm excited to, to join all of you here um, at, at Winship Cancer Institute and, and continue to promote um, rehabilitation care. So for this morning's talk, um, I'll begin by defining a few um, key terms in rehabilitation um, and uh, exercise oncology. We'll share uh, the more latest guidelines for exercise in our individuals with cancer, kind of the status of exercise participation and um, physical function um, in cancer, and then also the role of PMNR in improving both physical function and exercise participation. 
and some will conclude by sharing some examples of what cancer centers across the country um, are doing to deliver um, exercise related programming um, alongside uh, cancer care. So the first term I wanted to define um, is physical function. And so physical function is a multi-dimensional construct made up of balance, ambulation and one's ability to walk, joint mobility, range of motion, and collectively, it's really getting at one's ability to carry out their activities of daily living. So I think about this as one's typical morning routine, their ability to brush their teeth, go to the bathroom, shower, get dressed, prepare a meal, but then also some of those instrumental activities such as doing chores around the house, uh, balancing a checkbook, being able to work. And so as it is like a multidimensional construct, there are of course multiple ways to measure it. Um, and it's a construct that's measured by validated objective and subjective outcome measures. So some examples of clinician and patient reported outcome measures are depicted here on the left. Um, I think most all of you are, are probably especially familiar with the ECOG and Karnofsky, and then oh, certainly the ERTC SF36 physical function subdomains are uh, commonly used in um, the literature. And then perhaps in more recent years, the promise item banks have uh, gained popularity both in research and clinical care. There are a multitude of ways to objectively capture physical function. Um, one of them is the sit to stand test, which is a measure of proximal strength, endurance, and functional mobility. Grip strength, um, which is also a marker for global health, used as one of the measures to capture frailty. Gait speed or ambulation, balance, and then we also have tests to measure muscle strength with like a one repetition maximum. So chest strength um, um, with the chest press or upper body strength and then leg strength, the proximal leg strength with um, a one rep leg test. And so we know that these objective and subjective outcome measures give us a um, perhaps a more broader and accurate picture of overall physical function. But this carries into informing us about other medical outcomes and healthcare system level outcomes. So for example, gait speed has been studied in the generalized hospital population, and it was found to be predictive of future hospitalization, a predictor of adverse events, and also discharge to home, um, which also then connects to level of caregiver assistance or burden. And it was found a gait speed of, of certainly of one or higher led to more independence and then um, fewer adverse events. Um, but so we kind of look at at least point aid as the cutoff um, in rehabilitation care. And then similarly, individuals have looked at predictive values of grip strength, gait speed in hematologic stem cell outcomes relating to both survival and rehospitalization. So gaining utility and relevance um, beyond kind of just assessing physical function and, and rehabilitation care. Similarly, patient reported outcome measures are also demonstrating um, kind of broader clinical utility. And so the ones um, that I use in my clinical practice um, alongside many other rehabilitation physicians are the PROMISE item banks. And there is a specific PROMISE short form for our cancer population. And so this is a validated short form. It was developed by a group of PMNR physicians um, and they selected questions um, that um, would inform our clinical evaluation and care. Um, so they get at things such as functional mobility, um, such as being able to walk for 15 minutes, going up and down stairs. Um, they also get at proximal strength and endurance, which is lost um, in the context of systemic treatment, hospitalizations, post-surgery, such as being able to get on and off the toilet. Also looking at fine motor strength impacted by neuropathy, um, in terms of being able to tie shoes, um, button things, use things with our fingers, and then kind of putting it all together, recognizing that function requires strength, endurance, coordination, balance. So being able to carry something a little bit heavier up a flight of stairs or doing some of those um, kind of more strenuous household activities. And we've seen promise use not only in sort of being able to describe the, the physical function status of the cancer population, um, but also showing some clinical utility. Individuals have looked to see if baseline promise scores then predict um, overall cancer-related outcomes, survivorship, even in those with metastatic disease. So it's certainly gaining um, um, more implementation. 
The second term I'd like to define is physical exercise. So exercise um, certainly relates to physical function. One needs a certain level of physical function in order to engage in exercise. What distinguishes exercise is that it's a subset of physical activity that's um, you know, intentionally structured and repetitive. And the end goal is to optimize physical fitness, which can relate to one's day-to-day -day activities, but um, isn't certainly exclusive to that. And the reason I wanted to define exercise is that it's becoming um, more and more relevant in delivering uh, cancer care. So prior to 2019, there were guidelines um, cancer survivors and exercise. Um, and those guidelines were the same for the general population. And that was that individuals should engage in about 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise a week or 75 minutes of vigorous intensity exercise. However, from the timing of those recommendations till about you know, 2018, there was exponential growth in the number of randomized controlled trials um, for exercise in cancer survivors. And we were getting more information about how exercise may influence other health-related outcomes. So the American College of Sports Medicine convened a roundtable, and this involved representation from NCCI, uh, NCI, NCCN, the CDC, um, American Cancer Society, and our national PMNR organization, and, and their individuals are represented across countries. So they came together and reviewed um, uh, several meta-analyses and systematic reviews, collectively representing about 2,500 randomized control trials. And upon review of that, they then published um, an update of guidelines and also identified how exercise um, may be associated with improved health outcomes. So before you specifically getting into what those roundtable um, papers showed, I thought it would be helpful to first define exercise intensity. Um, so it can be defined by METS or maximum heart rate, and then um, we categorize it into mild, moderate, and vigorous. So what does that mean? So mild intensity exercise, those are, that's physical function. That's our activities of daily living, the showering, preparing a meal, kind of getting dressed, doing one's morning routine. And that does expend energy. And that's about um, less than three mets or 55 to 65% of maximum heart rate. The next category is moderate. And this um, might be more of what we think of being a little bit more physically active, walking at a speed of about three to four miles per hour, cycling at five to 10 miles per hour, even dancing, yoga, gardening, depending on the intensity, can classify one as engaging in a moderate level of physical activity. Now, the next one is probably what many of us um, classify as like cardiovascular aerobic exercise. It's a little bit more rigorous. This can involve running, swimming, biking at a faster pace, singles, tennis, cross-country skiing. That's really where we're sweating and our heart is, our heart is pumping. And so keeping that in mind, the roundtable findings, reviewing those like 2,500 plus um, controlled trials, they identified that 90 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic exercise performed about two to three times a week with or without resistance training over a duration of six to 12 weeks improves symptom burden in individuals with cancer. The key take home point is the 90 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic exercise for all of these outcomes here listed on the left. So they found strong evidence for cancer related fatigue, physical function, health-related quality of life, lymphedema, anxiety, and depression. And then they also identified moderate evidence for bone health and sleep. I think key things to know about what, um, what these exercise intervention trials entailed and how they were designed um, is that they all involved some component of aerobic exercise, which entailed oftentimes walking or cycling. And then the resistance component usually involved bands or weights um, kind of targeting um, the major muscle groups with repetitions of about eight to 12, um, just to give you an idea. The studies were mixed in terms of the cancer diagnoses, although for certain health-related outcomes, um, specifically like lymphedema, majority of the trials were done in breast. Um, and they were mixed in terms of whether individuals were currently in active treatment for cancer or had completed their active treatment. And physical function um, was self-reported um, in, in these randomized control trials um, for the large um, majority. Now, the 
following outcomes here, they were also assessed, um, but at the time of the trials, there is insufficient evidence um, to you know, really say whether or not they impacted quality of life, physical function, psychological well-being. And those included cardiotoxicity, chemotherapy-induced neuropathy, cognitive decline, and cachexia. Uh, however, there are ongoing trials in this registered. Um, and so hope maybe in the upcoming years, we'll, be, we'll have a, a little bit more information and be able to assess whether exercise influences these outcomes as well. So in addition to looking at, um, you know, how does exercise um, impact these other aspects of symptom burden, side effects that are commonly experienced by our cancer patients, they were also interested in looking at the impact on survival. And so what this roundtable finding concluded was that, again, that 90 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic exercise, plus or minus that resistance training, may be associated with improved survival for breast, colorectal, and prostate cancer individuals. Um, it is certainly a maybe, and, and want to draw your attention to um, the number of studies that were available for assessment. So certainly smaller than like the 2,000 that were used um, to identify the other health-related outcomes. You had 12 in breast cancer, 7 in colorectal, 4 in prostate, and, and just one um, for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, with that being said, you know, certainly the relative risk is, is favorable at 0.7, um, but certainly more work is needed. And it should be noted that um, these survival outcomes were captured from observational cohort studies, not necessarily an exercise interventional trial. However, um, with that being said, I think there is um, a growing interest in evaluating how those individuals who become physically active after cancer diagnosis may have more favorable health outcomes, may have more favorable survival outcomes, um, but certainly more, um, you know, kind of higher quality, um, more granular work is needed. But it is something that they evaluated in this, um, in this study. So overall, given the growing amount of evidence supporting um, the benefits of exercise in our cancer population, a number of national organizations have um, presented guidelines that do recommend exercise um, for those undergoing active treatment and those in, in longer term survivorship. And more specifically, last year, um, ASCO released their exercise diet and weight management guidelines. And so in these guidelines, they said that oncology providers, they should recommend aerobic and resistance exercise for those undergoing active treatment to mitigate the side effects of cancer. So because of its impact on fatigue, quality of life, physical function. Um, and they provided, they stated like a strong level of recommendation for that. They also mentioned prehab. So they said that providers may recommend pre-op exercise for patients undergoing specifically lung um, cancer surgery or resection. And, and that was um, drawn from the benefits that were shown in meta-analyses for reducing length of hospital stay and post-op compl uh, complications. But it should be noted that that was a weaker recommendation. Unlike ACSM, ASCO said that, you know, there really is insufficient evidence to um, really um, make a, a recommendation for exercise in terms of survival benefits, um, which um, I, I think is, you know, certainly it, it makes sense based on the level of, of evidence that that was approved. So um, when I'm talking to patients, I'm really emphasizing the benefits of exercise and improving side effects and symptoms. Um, and if they ask about survival, I'll share that, you know, there is research underway, more information is needed, but there is, you know, a sense that those that are more physically active after diagnosis overall tend to fare better. Um, but we need more research to, to, you know, to give any more specific information and accurate information than that. And so all of this is like, specifically as like a rehab physician is really encouraging um, that exercise can um, move the needle on some of these side effects because we don't have a quick pill or fix um, to treat fatigue or physical dysfunction. Um, or even when it comes to psychological well-being, it, it often requires multiple modalities. However, with that being said, there are also a number of barriers to exercise in the general population and then, of course, for individuals with cancer. And those include time, personal beliefs, and attitudes towards exercise. Do they have access to exercise-related programming while undergoing treatment? And then certainly fear of injury, which is very real for the cancer patient, and especially in those with musculoskeletal meds, a history of pathologic fracture. 
And then the big one that I certainly see in my clinic is that symptom burden, including impaired physical function. And that's really where, um, you know, rehab can play a role. And so it's been pretty well described in the literature that patients with cancer are at risk and do develop reduced physical function. And this is seen across cancer diagnoses, across treatment modalities, and may persist for years. Just last week, JAMA Oncology um, published this study, which was an analysis of the cohort in the Women's Health Initiative. So this um, was a kind of a case control study where they looked at about 9,000 um, female cancer uh, survivors compared to about 45,000 match control. And then because of the nature of the women's health um, data collection, they had information pre and post diagnosis. I think some key takeaway points to um, get out of these findings is that after diagnosis, we certainly see um, perhaps the more rapid functional decline in that first year, which makes sense. So when they're undergoing at least the bulk of their active treatment. And it should What's perhaps a little bit more significant to me um, is that in those individuals, and especially with breast, endometrial, and lung cancer survivors, is that that, that um, deficit in physical function persists in the years after. And these individuals may have also been on, certainly on, on some sort of maintenance therapy may have had recurrence. But regardless, they have physical function impairments, reduced levels of physical function years after diagnosis. Building upon that, there is national data on um, patient reported physical function. And this was published by um, the team that really um, led the initiative of uh, researching the Promise Item Bank's cancer care. Um, so with this paper, they looked at a cohort of about 5,000 individuals. Um, I think a strength of this cohort was that it was a little bit more racially diverse um, compared to some other cohort studies in the sense that um, it had 20% of participants that were Black, about 20% um, Latino, and then 16% Asian, which is a little bit more diverse than what we often see. And what they identified was that, again, across most cancer types, individuals were reporting a lower level of physical function. So now for PROMISE, a normal T-score is 50 or higher. Um, so all these um, cancer diagnoses, except prostate, um, did report lower levels of physical function, recognizing that these were captured at different time points in care, individuals were at different um, time points in survivorship. Interestingly, prostate cancer um, fell within the normal range. Um, but we don't know if these are individuals with more localized disease had been on um, surveillance and had not received um, any active treatment. So now bringing it a little bit closer to home, I was interested in evaluating my um, personal clinic data um, uh, from my last institution. So these were about 700 um, patients that were seen in my clinic. These are all new patient visits. Um, and I was curious to see, you know, where did they stand along the spectrum of physical function? Now, I expected them to have some level of, of physical function deficits or impairments because they're being referred to seeing a PM&R physician. Um, but what was interesting is that across diagnoses, um, individuals were falling below a T-score of 50, so indicating moderate or mild levels of physical dysfunction. And the ones that were making it to my clinic, it was those with lung multiple myeloma, leukemia, and lymphoma that were reporting the lowest levels of physical function. Now, again, these are patients that ultimately made it to my clinic, so other factors may have influenced who's you know, ultimately being seen, um, but this certainly informs um, you know, my clinical practice, how I work with a therapist, exercise specialist to direct our programming. And are there certain cancer populations that we should especially um, be focusing on or perhaps um, um, emphasizing our like kind of physical function screening efforts to direct patients to rehabilitation care? So it, it was certainly informative. Now, a lot of the literature in physical function um, is patient reported, um, but we also know that we kind of need the objective side too of capturing physical function. Um, both um, inform overall health outcomes. And so I started capturing a few um, physical function tests in clinic, one of them being the 30 seconds to stand. So we started this later on, so certainly a smaller number of patients completed it, but across about 200 um, patients, we did find, again, a number of individuals were scoring um, or performing um, fewer number of sit-to-stands compared to what their values should be based on. 
And so normative values do vary by age, but just to give you some context, normative values for someone aged 80 to 85, they should be able to on average perform about 12 sit to stands in 30 seconds. So um, kind of keeping that in mind, um, Individuals with lung, bladder, gynonc, prostate, multiple myeloma, colorectal, CNS tumors, sarcoma, they all had sit to stands that were lower than 12. So on average, lower than age expected um, normative values. So giving us a little bit more information um, on their overall level of physical function. Um, and this Objective measures measures are certainly less widely captured, um, so I, I think that it carries relevance for publishing future research if we can both show the patient reported, clinician reported, and objective side. So then that brings me to the role of rehab medicine. So, so far, I, I hope I've communicated that um, exercise is beneficial in individuals with cancer and specifically in alleviating um, side effects of declines in physical function, fatigue, um, and overall health-related quality of life. Um, however, patients with cancer experience a physical function decline. Um, they report lower levels of physical function. They've been shown in research to have lower functional mobility, endurance with a sit to stand. They've been shown to have lower levels of grip strength. Um, and there are multiple reasons why patients might, ex might experience that decline in physical function because they have multiple issues going on um, relating to their symptom burden. Patients report fatigue, weakness, neuropathy, arthralgias, also pathologic fractures. They also may report um, pelvic floor dysfunction, lymphedema, muscle spasms, balance changes, cognitive changes as well. And so it can be hard to think about exercise when you're experiencing one or more of these issues. Um, so our job as the rehab physician is to, you know, certainly evaluate these underlying symptoms, identifying the etiology, and then of course, improving the symptom, you know, for the sake of symptom relief itself. Um, however, patients also have broader goals. Um, they want to improve their muscle pain. They want to improve their balance, their pelvic floor function um, for kind of the broader goal of being able to like getting back to their day-to-day -day activities, engaging in activities that are meaningful them meaningful to them. So in our evaluation, we're not only assessing the symptom burden, but we're also trying to get a better grasp of what is it that this patient hopes to do? What are their goals? And so patients um, have reported to me that, you know, they want to feel like they haven't aged 40 years, or they want to be able to golf next spring. Uh, they've shared that they want to be continent, you know, at my daughter's wedding. This was a patient after lower anterior resection syndrome. Um, they have cancer-related goals. I need to get stronger before I can get a transplant. And then sometimes they'll say things like, you know, my labs are great, but what about, you know, the rest of me? How can the rest of me feel great? And this final statement is certainly paraphrased, but I probably hear this on a daily basis where patients will say, I know I needed my cancer treatment. I'm incredibly grateful for it. They'll name all of you, um, your oncology, their oncology providers, but then they'll kind of hesitantly and with a bit of guilt say, I didn't realize that being a survivor meant more issues. And that's where we as a rehab physician, we can, you know, listen to this, we can you know, their gratitude, but then also validate, you know, these symptoms are also difficult to live with on a day-to-day -day basis. And they are barriers to doing their day-to-day -day activities to engaging in exercise. So our goal is, can we reduce these physical impairments with the hope of improving their physical function, which then in turn leads to, you know, making physical, engaging in physical exercise a little bit more attainable, with the broader goal of improving their overall symptom burden, their fatigue, their overall quality of life, their psychological well-being, and then hopefully also those cancer-related outcomes, being able to continue their care, make it to the next step of treatment, and then tolerating treatment better. So because what we do as rehab physicians um, is, is quite broad, I thought it would be helpful to share a few patient examples. So the first patient here um, was someone um, that I'd seen. She's 69 years old, history of cervical cancer, kind of completed her, her, um, her regimen of active treatment, coming in to see me about six to eight months post all of this. And she's telling me that she has this ongoing low back pain, pain that's like shooting down her right anterior thigh, this bladder urgency, pelvic pain, and then lower extremity numbness and weakness. So certainly a few different um, things likely going on. 
So her musculoskeletal exam was non-localizing. She kind of had pain and stiffness, um, you know, no matter which joint I assessed. Her neuro exam was a little bit more um, localizing. She presented with bilaterally reduced sensation in that stocking glove distribution. She had weakness of her hip girdle muscles, but that right hip flexor muscle was much weaker than the left. She was just anti-gravity, very little resistance. And because of that, she was ambulating with what we call a circumduction gait pattern, swinging that leg to clear her foot. And then she walked longer distances in clinics, she fatigued and started dragging her toe, which is, I wasn't expecting that asymmetry. And her goals were to keep walking, walk, working, and then also to walk normally. She didn't really wanna draw that much attention to herself. Um, so, you know, just like any other physician, I'm reviewing her um, prior records, her labs, her imaging. Um, and then one of her, in her prior CT scans, um, past few ones, had shown this lymphocele that was sitting on her psoas muscle, right, where the lumbar plexus um, runs through. So I got an EMG on her just to kind of see, you know, is this lymphocele um, doing anything? And it did reveal a right-sided lumbar plexopathy. She had some, what we call some subacute denervation, but was also showing signs of nerve recovery, which was encouraging. And then also other findings that were more consistent with her length-dependent um, chemo-induced neuropathy. The other thing that was a little bit um, unusual with her was this shooting pain down the right thigh. Um, she certainly had degenerative changes on her lumbar spine imaging, um, so certainly at risk of developing like a lumbar radiculopathy, which can cause that shooting pain. Um, however, she had undergone months of physical therapy, had seen physicians, undergone lumbar epidural steroid injections, and it did not even touch her pain. So I did a, a pelvic exam on her, but my intention of the pelvic exam was to evaluate her pelvic floor muscles. Um, and once I uh, palpated her obturatus internus muscle, upon activating it and palpating it, it reproduced that right low extremity pain shooting down um, her anterior thigh, um, which provided a little bit more information about what was going on. So in putting this patient together, on the left are, you know, her physical impairments are, you know, diagnoses. So she kind of had this toe dragging foot drop, but it wasn't due necessarily to ankle weakness. It was really due to that weak right hip flexor. So we needed to strengthen that hip, but she still needed to not drag her foot. So we gave, talked to her about getting a pair of rocker sole shoes, which fortunately are just more popular today. They are a little bit curved at the sole, and that restores a little bit more of that heel to toe motion. Patients don't have to drag their foot as much. For her pelvic pain, connected her with pelvic floor physical therapy, but then also performed an ultrasound guided obturator internus injection to provide more long lasting relief. She was interested in being in the water. Um, and I think aqua therapy is really helpful for improving strength balance coordination. So she started on that. And then also prescribed her Lyrica for um, kind of a persistent neuropathic pain. Some of her bladder urgency, sometimes I figured would improve with pelvic therapy, but started her on Mibertric um, just to get her, allow her to get by in the meantime. And then during all this time, you know, she reported, you know, levels of distress and anxiety that she was having uh, more difficulty managing. So I referred her to colleagues in psycho-oncology. So at time of follow-up, which was about um, eight to 10 months out, she shared that she had returned to walking for exercise, was no longer dragging her foot, the circumduction had improved. Um, she was engaging in adaptive yoga, was started resuming Zumba, and she continued to work um, in retail. The next patient here, a little, little bit younger, 19 years old, former athlete, diagnosed with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. Underwent chemo, had this multi-month hospitalization um, with recurrent issues, infections, and along the way developed um, thoracolumbar compression deformities, peripheral neuropathy. He was someone that I was following on the hospital side, but then also in clinic. So I saw him maybe about two to three months um, post-hospitalization. Um, at this time, he had ongoing proximal weakness, which we see with just deconditioning from I mean, um, you know, immobile for so long, and then also more profound distal weakness, which was consistent with his neuropathy. And then looking at his imaging, we can appreciate um, those multi-level um, compression deformities. They're all stable. Um, there's no retropulsion, but certainly his spine does, that, does not look like that of a typical 19 years old individual. And his goals were, you know, he just wanted to walk normally. He wanted to travel before starting college. Um, and he also wanted to move back to his house. His parents had moved out of their multi-level home into a one-level trailer just because um, he 
he had to navigate stairs in his original home and wasn't able to do so um, with the neuropathy and the foot drop. So for his foot drop, um, he ultimately required a custom AFO, which you're able to coordinate for him to really give him that stability at the ankle and then also at the knees. Um, and then he participated in neurologic based rehab um, at um, within the hospital system. In regards to his multi-level compression fractures, he was stable, which is good, didn't need any surgical intervention, um, but he still needed some extra support. Um, so we negotiated on wearing a semi-rigid spine brace, um, which is depicted here on the right. Um, the one I like is the SpinoMed um, because it has straps that um, we can adjust for comfort and also has this aluminum panel in it that we can adjust to their curvature. And it's um, approved for individuals with stable compression fractures and covered by insurance. And then we also had to give him exercises to strengthen those paraspinal muscles because of just that added stress to his spine and his muscles had become weak um, with everything he had gone through. So gave him some exercises that he could do on his own. And then we talked about a walking program as well. He needed to start at a more mild intensity just because, um, you know, his, his hemoglobin was still low. He was still kind of condition. So even like doing ADLs was causing him to become tachycardic. So we started um, kind of slow for him. But at about um, um, six months out, he was all able to travel um, internationally over that summer, enrolled in college in the fall, and then reported adherence to like um, an, a home exercise program. So he completed his outpatient PT. The next patient here is someone I have followed for about um, for probably most of my duration at Utah. So he was an individual with prostate cancer, underwent surgical resection, developed fractures, required radiation as well, um, and developed this lumbar lumbosacral plexopathy. So he came in um, to my clinic with this diffuse low back pain, leg swelling, weakness. And on his exam, um, he had pain all over. He was curled up in the fetal position. I had to see him on a stretcher and infusion. Um, he presented with hip weakness, ankle dorsiflexion weakness, asymmetric, more consistent with his underlying plexopathy. We were able to get him to sit to stand um, with assistance, and he was able to ambulate maybe about 15, 20 steps in the exam room um, with a rolling walker, certainly hunched and shuffling. Um, and he also had some leg swelling to, to top it off. Um, and I asked him what his goals were, and, and, and he looked at me uh, very matter-of-factly and said, I need to ski again. I'm someone that only skis during storms. I need to get back on the slopes. But, you know, I, I'd be fine if I could at least golf first. So we, we had a conversation about, you know, this is what, you know, this is where you currently are. Um, this is, you know, how you came into my clinic. And, you know, back in, you know, 60 plus years ago, when you, before you could run, you had to learn to sit up, roll, stand, and then walk. So we kind of talked about how his rehab would similarly be stepwise, but he was committed. So in looking at his, um, you know, rehab impairments or physical function issues, he presented with altered gait, balance, proximal weakness, lymphedema and fatigue. For the gait balance and weakness, we started off with a home exercise program. It would just be too much to get to therapy one to two times a week. Um, but then he did get to a point where he was able to transition to outpatient. And then in the meantime, we talked about ambulating with the rollator so he could increase his walking tolerance, but then take those seated rest breaks when needed. For the leg swelling, got Dopplers just to make sure um, there was an underlying DVT and then connected him with lymphedema therapy. For the fatigue in the beginning, our focus really did relate to energy conservation techniques. Um, he was getting fatigued with just doing his morning routine. Um, and then we did talk about protein goals to support muscle strength and endurance as he was increasing his walking distances, improving his strength. And then we did do a brief trial of neurostimulants in his situation just because of how limiting the fatigue was. But overall, um, as he, um, you know, went through his rehabilitation course, he was able to resume ADT. He didn't have to, um, he was previously needing to take breaks because of the fatigue. He was able to transition from therapy into the hospital supervised exercise program. And he did make it back to the mountains with which he told me he may have had some gentle falls, but no marked skeletal injuries or anything.
So my hope is that with these, you know, three patients, um, we've been able to demonstrate that patients come in with multiple symptoms, and ultimately they have there are related to multiple musculoskeletal and neurologic etiologies. Um, and then our job as the rehab physician is to try and piece that all together and then come up with a plan that can involve multiple modalities or intervention to improve those underlying um, impairments or physical function diagnoses to improve their function and overall exercise participation. So just to reiterate, our interventions are usually multimodal. We certainly perform injections, musculoskeletal into the joint, into muscles to alleviate um, pain and restrictions. We also perform diagnostic studies such as EMGs um, to further characterize and localize peripheral nerve injuries. And then we prescribe equipment. Um, our goal is always to try to restore function, but sometimes we can't do that. And we have to um, teach patients to adapt or compensate in different ways, but to still achieve that same end goal. Um, so we um, do um, prescribe mobility devices and orthotic bracing for our patients. And like all other physicians, we prescribe medications and our focus is really on musculoskeletal neuropathic pain and then do prescribe some bowel bladder meds for those with neurogenic bowel and bladder, secondary to cord compression, secondary to cauda equina. And I also do use compounded medications um, a lot for neuropathic pain, but then also for patients um, with pelvic pain. And then we work really closely with our colleagues in rehabilitation therapies and then those that um, administer supervised exercise. Um, so we write a pretty specific therapy script with the underlying musculoskeletal and neurologic diagnosis, what exactly I want the focus of their therapy to be, and then also any specific precautions um, in their interventions, which is especially relevant for patients um, that do have skeletal meds, for example. Um, exercises. Um, in our department, we have access to a program called MedBridge, where we're able to um, develop a personalized video-based um, program. So after our clinic visit, they have at least three to, you know, sometimes six exercises that they can start that day while we're waiting to get connected, you know, with rehab therapies or, an out, or a community-based exercise program. So my hope ultimately is that for the patient, their plan is personalized and practical. It can involve that therapy or exercise prescription, some equipment like braces or mobility devices, maybe some neuropathic or musculoskeletal pain medications. They may undergo procedures um, such as a botulinum toxin injection for a muscle spasm or a joint injection for pain. They may undergo further diagnostic testing, such as an EMG or further imaging to really identify the etiology. Not everything is related to their cancer treatment. They may have something else going on. And then consults. We work really closely with um, individuals in interventional pain to perform more specialized procedures. Um, and then certainly individuals in supportive oncology and palliative, recognizing um, you know, their patients may need to have those broader goals of care discussions, may have um, additional symptoms um, with more diffuse pain, nausea that are impacting their physical function. And ultimately, collectively, our goal, again, is to improve their physical function and to promote exercise. Now, given all this, um, there certainly are um, an increasing number of, of rehabilitation programs that are being integrated in cancer um, centers. There are a growing number of oncology pulmonary physicians. Um, and it's certainly growing, which is encouraging. But nationally, it's still estimated that maybe only about 20 to 30 percent of rehab needs are met. And still, only about 30 to 50% of cancer survivors report physical activity, despite the growing evidence of physical exercise, improving fatigue, improving physical function, improving psychological well-being, despite national guidelines across um, rehabilitation and oncologic organizations. And, um, you know, perhaps what is more, a little bit more striking is that 20 to 35 to 30 percent of survivors report being physically inactive. Um, so how can we move the needle on that? And um, things are already in place. Um, and, and I wanted to highlight some examples of supervised exercise programs um, that exist um, in the United States um, at MCI designated comprehensive cancer center. So the following are just three programs. Um, I'm sure there are many more. I um, mean, we have um, work um, 
under um, that's currently um, kind of undergoing to, to kind of get a list of what all these different NCI programs are doing and how their programs are structured. But these are at least three um, that I'm going to highlight this morning. So the programs are um, housed at um, Huntsman, the University of Utah, where I previously was, um, in Colorado and UNC. I chose these three because this is all, these are programs where I also was able to find um, published findings on um, their outcomes. So these programs are, are pretty similar in structure. Um, they're, they all offer on-site and virtual programming. Um, two out of the three offer one-to-one -one supervised exercise, and UNC offers small group exercise. Um, they all have multidisciplinary teams. Um, all of them have certified exercise trainers, which makes sense that with it being a supervised aerobic and resistance program. Um, and then they also have involvement from rehab therapies, medical oncologists, um, PhD, you know, researchers in, in different spheres. Um, and then where I was, um, we were a team of three PMNR physicians. Um, and then in regards to eligibility, um, it certainly varies. For certain programs, um, patients, it looks like, can participate at any time point, um, active treatment or into longer-term survivorship. And then certain programs do require a patient being kind of a certain period from active treatment. Um, and then they all require clearance. This might be done by the medical oncologist um, or in Utah, um, because we had PM&R physicians, um, we were the ones um, doing that clearance to participate. The frequency um, is anywhere from two to three times a week, and, most, and these three programs um, all last for about three months, um, and then some do allow for um, participating for even longer periods of time. The cost, I think, overall is nominal, certainly at UNC, it's zero dollars, um, and at the other two institutions, it's about sixty dollars a month. Still an out-of-pocket cost, um, so don't want to dismiss that, um, but it is lower than what one would pay to work one-on-one -on -one with a trainer. Um, where I'm especially interested in, you know, how do these um, centers fund these programs? So that's what we're hoping to get more information on in the future. Um, but just from um, anecdotal conversations, there's certainly funding um, that's largely provided by the Cancer Center itself. Um, and then a, a few programs certainly rely heavily on like donor and philanthropic support. So again, um, they're popping up across the country, which is really exciting to see. And I think um, perhaps what is even more encouraging um, and probably draws which should draw more of our attention is that they're also um, publishing their findings. Um, so they're publishing outcomes in a, in a very clinical setting. It's not in a very structured, rigorous research sphere. And the findings, understandably, then are, are certainly mixed. Um, the, stat, the status right now is those, these are this observational research. Um, but when they do look at their three month follow up data, um, they do see improvements in physical function. So in VO2 max, in functional mobility, they see lower levels of fatigue and improved psychological well-being. Um, so certainly um, encouraging findings. Now, these institutions certainly vary in terms of which outcome measure was used, um, but, there are, um, but there are similarities across what individuals are collecting. Um, so the hope is, is that in the future, this observational research, um, you know, perhaps can then be informative in developing randomized control trials. So perhaps we can gain a little bit more information on are there certain cancer diagnoses that improve more than others? Are there certain time points in care that we really should be um, uh, counseling patients on engaging in exercise? Um, so hopefully this can kind of lay the groundwork for performing some of more of that randomized rigorous research and then also um, asking some of those more granular questions. But I think this is um, a great start in the field of, of oncology rehab and exercise. So then that brings me to, well, what are we doing here at Winship Cancer Institute? Uh, we have an oncology rehab program. Um, many of you are, know Dr. Khanna, who is the director, um, and I'm excited to you know have the opportunity um, to join his team and to work Inside him to provide rehabilitation care um, for our patients. And we work very closely with the Revital Cancer Program. So that is um, the company that Emory um, has 
contract with to provide um, physical therapy and occupational therapy services at a number of our Emory sites. Um, and so those are the therapists that are housed at um, Winship on Clifton Road and a number of um, outpatient community sites. We also work really closely with the therapists that provide care um, at Midtown and at Johns Creek. Um, so the idea is that collectively um, we work as a team to care for our patients and especially for we're in more um, continuous contact for those with more complex medical um, and rehab needs. So thank you all for your attention this morning. Um, so to summarize, um, you know, the key points of of today's talk, I think um, the things to walk away with are that 90 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic exercise per week especially when it's supervised, improves cancer-related symptoms. So specifically fatigue, physical function, overall quality of life, and psychological well-being. And that evidence is robust enough for national organizations to recommend physical exercise after a cancer diagnosis, so including those undergoing active treatment. However, um, while all of this is very encouraging, there are barriers to exercise. And one of the big ones is limitations in physical function. Um, it's hard to exercise with neuropathy, fatigue, musculoskeletal pain, and a dysfunction. And that's where rehab medicine can really play a role in evaluating and treating those underlying limitations to overall improve their physical function status and to promote exercise participation. And so the final slide here um, is more for housekeeping, is um, for practical purposes, how can you get a hold of us? Um, so this is our referral in EPIC. Um, it's ambulatory referral to rehab and physical medicine. You click the cancer rehab button. Um, I, we, you know, I, I just joined here, um, certainly have availability to see patients. So please do reach out um, if there's any difficulty in connecting patients um, with Dr. Kano or myself. Um, and then as a, as a, um, um, to kind of reiterate, these are the common conditions um, that we see um, and can evaluate um, and treat. And then the QR code is a link to our website. Uh, so thank you all um, for your attention um, this morning and um, please feel free to ask any questions. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Rosa. That was fantastic. Um, we do have some time for questions, as she mentioned, um, so please don't hesitate to quickly add your questions uh, to the chat box, and I will do my best to moderate. Um, while we're waiting, um, my name is uh, Dr. Ashish Khanna, um, and many of you know me already, like uh, Dr. Oza said, uh, as in the uh, as of the oncology rehabilitation uh, a physician at Winship. Um, so I really just couldn't be happier to bring someone as uh, brilliant and well-trained as Dr. Oza on board for our department. So thank you all for giving her such a, a warm welcome to Winship and Atlanta in general. Um, and of course, uh, please keep her in mind uh, for the needs of your patients. I'm sure as you uh, listen to her speak, a few people probably come to mind as they do for me. She has a very uh, broad range of expertise. So uh, ho hopefully you guys will uh, reach out and use her as a, as a resource. Uh, really a fantastic addition uh, to, to Winship. Okay. Um, so the first question that we have is, um, Dr. Oza, do you find relationship or support issues impend, impeding rehab uh, and would coaching in that area help? Yeah, I think um, their patients will report um, feeling um, isolated during their cancer care. Um, they may, they also have other familial and like social roles that they have to carry out. Um, so I do think that there is a role for health coaching. Um, I think it's, we, you, we can't rehab someone if they're um, if they're um, if they're struggling with like their emotional and psychological well-being. Um, so we uh, 
at our, like at our last practice, um, we worked really closely with our social worker, um, psycho-oncology um, to help in that area. Um, I know that, for example, at UNC, they, um, at least on the research side, um, they have developed um, a pretty comprehensive health coaching program as well to address um, kind of those underlying um, psychological um, and emotional um, contributors or um, um, issues as well. Um, so I definitely think it impedes rehab. I, I think um, it sometimes their, their patient is coming in for like post mastectomy pain. And before I can even talk about exercise, we're talking about um, their emotional support system. Um, so we do have to address that first or in parallel. Uh, great. I just wanted to clarify. I'm sorry. Uh, so uh, not the chat feature, but the questions go in the uh, Q&A uh, section. Um, uh, Dr. Ramalingam says, thank you for the great presentation, and uh, he's excited to have you here. Uh, he asked, for patients who get brief courses of curative adjuvant therapies, where do you see the role of rehab in that? Um, I think, and, and please let me know if I'm, I'm misinterpreting the question. Um, I think one role could be is assessing what their baseline um, functional status is. So instead of kind of like prehab for all, um, if they're in that do score, um, like in their frailty zone for functional status, or we know that they're at higher risk of functional decline um, after those courses of treatment, I think that's where rehab can be helpful. Or if it's someone um, that has like under or kind of coexisting musculoskeletal neurologic comorbidity. So a patient with multiple sclerosis, for example, or history of stroke um, or pretty advanced arthritis. I think um, we can still address those issues as they're undergoing cancer treatment. Um, they can certainly seek that care elsewhere, but I think patients appreciate if they're able to kind of see the, the physician who can address those conditions in the same setting in which they're receiving their cancer care. Um, so, so please let me know if, if that helps answer your question or if I can um, um, clarify it differently. All right, and um, Dr. Lawson would just like to circle back to his previous question uh, about the uh, um, relationship issues and was curious uh, in your estimation, what would you guess the frequency of relationship problems is? That's that's a good question. I honestly I'm not sure. And I, I wonder if it's I also wonder is how often we're we're screening or asking patients. Um I know that there has been work um been done. I've seen this more in like you know from the female cancer population for breast cancer um and gynonc patient cancers um in terms of looking at social support relationship. Um but I I'm yeah, I'm not sure. I um what, but a cop out answer would be is probably more than what we think it is. Um, I had a nurse um, who in her, my nurse who worked with me at my last institution, um, she um, put up like, um, like, paper flyers in the women's bathroom uh, for patients who were experiencing any sort of um, kind of like emotional distress concerns um, for abuse at home. And at the end of the first day, like all of those little papers had been ripped off of the flyers. So not sure, but um, imagine that it's more significant than we may think. Okay, we've got a couple more minutes. If uh, there are any further questions. Okay, um, we have a, uh, another question here uh, saying great presentation and introduction to your services. Uh, what is the evidence for improving physical outcomes using yoga or Pilates for patients with cancer? Are you familiar with that? Yeah, and there have been um, randomized controlled trials, but certainly with yoga. Um, and I think there might even be a systematic review looking at yoga. Um, and I think the um, the health outcomes where it's shown the most improvement is um, kind of perceived quality of life, um, psychological well-being. Um, and, and so there is um, 
evidence for that. I think um, there, there may be ongoing trials that are recording certainly patient reported physical outcome measures. Um, and then um, I think there's opportunity to um, assess it a little bit more robustly with objective physical outcome measures. So it's certainly something that's being studied in the integrative oncology sphere. Um, I think what makes it even trickier to assess, especially with yoga, is just um, the like the variation um, in which poses and asanas are, are performed um, in the setting. Um, so it's hard to compare study to study, but there has certainly been work in this sphere. Um, in a number of uh, integrative oncology programs do offer um, yoga um, as part of like the Cancer Center's Wellness Center. So there is growing evidence. I think most of it is psychological well-being. More recent research has shown improved patient reported physical function, um, but we don't have as much research, for example, looking at like grip strength, functional endurance measured by gait speed or sit to stand. All right, I think we have time for uh, one more question. Um, we have a, a request for you to, I guess, briefly just mention um, what you think about future, uh, the, the direction of future research in this topic. Yeah, um, so I think um, my vision for future research or what I think the gaps are is that I think we have the, a good amount of evidence that's describing like the physical function status across cancer diagnoses. And then now we have more robust evidence showing like the psychological, physical benefits of exercise in the population. But what we really don't have much of are those exercise or rehab interventional trials um, assessing cancer related outcomes. So treatment eligibility, adherence to treatment. So for example, are patients able to stay on um, the androgen deprivation therapies or their aromatase inhibitors? Um, does it impact their response to like checkpoint inhibitor therapy engaging in resistance or aerobic exercise? There's uh, some observational studies that are being done, some smaller randomized controlled trials, but we don't have as most much um, robust evidence. And then, of course, that, that broader issue of survival. Um, it's really only been studied primarily in breast colorectal prostate. There's some lung cancer trials out there. Um, and then again, the quality um, certainly needs to be heightened. Um, it's probably influenced by cancer subtype um, treatment modalities and what as well. So I think the future is really um, doing higher quality exercise trials and looking at those um, cancer outcomes. Um, and does it um, truly impact or influence them? And then if so, how do we implement it in clinical care? All right, fantastic. We are uh, at the end of our time, unfortunately, but uh, thank you, Dr. Rosa, for the wonderful presentation. And uh, of course, we're uh, she's always available for questions. And uh, thank you all very much. All right, thanks everyone. Hope you have a good day.